Hello and welcome to our sixth lecture in module eight. Uh, we have so far in this module talked about um, formal logic and reasoning, problem solving, and now we're going to finish up uh, the term with uh, discussions of decision making. This will be the first of two lectures on decision making. We're going to first talk about choice models, which refer to when we're making a choice between competing alternatives. And then we'll start looking at decision making under uncertainty, and in particular, uh, what's called normative decision making, or sometimes um, economic decision making. Uh, we'll even take a look at uh, a way to calculate the expected value of a decision um, for something like betting on roulette. So overall, uh, here's what we're going to talk about uh, over the next two lectures. For these three, le uh, uh, this current lecture, we're going to talk about the first three topics, choice models, decision making under uncertainty, um, and normative models, and then we will actually look at how people actually make decisions under uncertainty with some descriptive models and finish out with some other topics. So the first area of decision making we'll talk about are choice models. And these are situations involving where you have to choose amongst competing alternatives. Which college do I want to go to? What car do I want to buy? Um, what do I want to pick off the menu? These are choice alternatives. Um, so we tend to have two different kinds of decision-making strategies for choice situations, compensatory decision-making and non-compensatory decision-making. In compensatory decision-making, uh, it's a strategy for choosing between alternatives in which positive attributes can compensate for negative attributes. So while it might not be the features you want on a car, it gets the gas mileage you want. Um, while it might not be um, the exact college you want to go to, the positives can outweigh the negatives. In non-compensatory decision making, um, we make choices, uh, we eliminate choices if they do not meet some minimum standard. And we often use non-compensatory decision making uh, to narrow down the field. That is, um, we can eliminate a bunch of alternatives and get us down to a short list, so to speak. Um, colleges and universities do this all the time. Minimum GPA, minimum SAT, minimum GRE scores. Um, that's a way to el eliminate a, a bunch of people and then use compensatory decision making to select their final uh, pool of um, students. We do this all the time. So for example, if you're going to go car shopping, you can't possibly look at every car on the market. There are just too many. Most people decide, do I want a car, a truck, or an SUV? They start there. Um, do I want um, an American car or not an American car? Do I want a luxury car? What things do I need it to have? And then they'll find five or six, maybe five or six, um, cars they want to look at uh, more closely. Same thing with houses. Now. Um, so if we're looking for apartments, I need a two-bedroom, two-bath, rent no higher than uh, $2,500, something like that. Um, and then you can go around and look at the amenities and locations and try to figure out how to make that compensatory decision. So again, things like uh, cars, where we go to school um, is certainly another way in which we might use these different kinds of decision-making strategies. Um, you don't want it to be any further than 500 miles from home, or you don't want it to be closer than 500 miles from home, um, are both potential things you might look at. <clears throat> so um, that's a choice model. Uh, more often, we're faced with what's called decision making under, under uncertainty. We don't have enough information to need to estimate the likelihood of events. So um, when you graduate from school, you'll be forced to make this kind of decision when you are um, looking for jobs and you might get a job offer that's not exactly what you want. You have to estimate the likelihood that you might get a different job offer or a better job offer um, or uh, no job offer. So you have to figure out what's the likelihood of future events. So you have to kind of think about what might happen in the future. Um, in some other applied examples, judges have to decide whether to allow bail for defendants. Um, are they likely to flee? Are they likely to do something stupid? Um, or commit another crime while they're out on bail, uh, and there's absolutely no way to know that. Stock market investments, the absolute epitome of decision making under uncertainty. What information can I use to try to predict future performance? Career decisions. All these are uh, different ways in which uh, we go about making these kinds of, or the or situations in which we make these kinds of decisions. So there are two types of models that attempt to describe decision making under uncertainty, normative models and descriptive models. Normative models are those 
that are really based on math. And in fact, the original normative models um, were uh, developed by economists, and we'll talk a minute about Edwards uh, and his use of um, rational theory to explain decision making. Descriptive models describe how people actually make decisions, um, which we'll get to in the next lecture. So Edwards was an early proponent of normative decision making. He thought people were intuitive statisticians. As somebody who has taught statistics, I assure you this is not the case. Um, another great normative model is Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem is actually very useful in trying to provide a statistical rule uh, for the likelihood of an outcome given certain evidence. So the way Bayes' theorem works is um, it takes into account what we call prior probabilities. So for example, if uh, you were a woman who goes in uh, for a mammogram and the mammogram comes back positive, Bayes' theorem wouldn't take just into account what's the probability that that mammogram is correct. It would also include the probability that you had breast cancer when you walked in the door. And so it actually limits uh, and uh, constrains uh, the outcome, the probability of an outcome, because it's taking into account more information. So no medical test is 100% accurate. Um, and so by taking into account the probability that you had breast cancer before we knew any test results, we actually get more accurate information. So Bayes' theorem is particularly useful. Um, one of the first versions of sort of normative models are what we call expected value theory. And this is decision making based solely on calculation of costs and benefits. It's a rational theory that states that we choose those decisions that pay off best. So it takes into account both the probability of an outcome and the value of an outcome. And then we can calculate what's the value of that decision. So this is the basic uh, simplest version of expected value, um, depending on how many outcomes there might be. This is a two outcome scenario, uh, which we'll stick to because that's the simplest where you take the probability of outcome one, multiply it times the value of outcome one, and then add that to the probability of outcome two times the value of outcome two. So let's say we're gonna bet $5 on a coin toss. So the probability of outcome one is 50% that I win, and the value for that is that I gain $5. The probability of outcome two is that I lose 50%, again, 50% probability that I lose, and the value of that is that I lose $5, so it's negative five. So if we do all the math, 0.5 times five is $2.50, plus negative $2.50, the expected value is zero, right? Now, because I like my students to learn things that are practical, let's think about uh, bet on the roulette wheel. So let's say you saddle up to the roulette wheel, and you bet $10, that the ball is going to land on red. Probability of that is 47%. The value of that is you get $10, you win $10. Uh, the probability of outcome two, that the ball lands on a black or a green square. Remember there are two green spaces on the roulette wheel. This is one of the things people often forget. The value of that is of course I lose my $10. So uh, if we multiply all this out, uh, we end up with for every $10, I bet on red or black, I'm gonna on average lose 60 cents. So if I sat there all day and did the same bet over and over again, for every $10 I bet, on average I'm gonna lose 60 cents. So if I bet $100 altogether, I'm gonna lose $6. Uh, there's a reason why casinos are beautiful and lovely and lavish, because everything is in the house's favor. So let's try a different bet at the roulette wheel. I'm gonna bet $10 on the number 13. This is a 35 to one uh, bet. So there's a two and a half percent chance that it's gonna land on 13 and I'm gonna win $350, nice little payday. Uh, of course, there's a 97.4% chance that it's gonna land somewhere else and I'm gonna lose my 10 bucks. So for every $10 on this bet, I'm actually gonna lose 64 cents. So this is an even worse bet. Um, I should tell you that there, this all actually came uh, from what's called the Mensa book on casino gaming, or Mensa guide to casino gaming, I think it is, um, where they tell you sort of what is the long-term expected value of any decision you might make. So for every $10 you drop on a single number on the roulette wheel, you're going to lose 64 cents. Um, I should say that every casino bet has a long-term negative expected value for you, 
the person who's making the bet. There are a couple of exceptions. Uh, you can play poker, in which the house does not take um, a stake, in which case uh, then you will you can actually come out ahead and a single deck blackjack can actually be profitable but good luck finding that so that is expected value theory the problem is of course it doesn't work that this is not how people make decisions otherwise no one would ever gamble we also have to think about what's the psychological value um, of a decision and so we ended up then with expected utility theory it's still based on uh, a rational theory, but it's based on this idea of subjective value or utility. And so you could add in the value of entertainment to gambling, but you could also take into account things like um, what are your current circumstances? That is, is your money uh, more valuable than just its surface uh, face value? So for example, if you're in Vegas, you have $20 in your pocket that you need for the um, taxi ride to the airport, you're leaving the casino, very s slim chance that you're going to drop that $20 um, on the blackjack table on your way out. Because it has greater utility, because it's going to get you to the airport and then you don't have to schlep all your stuff on the bus. So, um, expected utility theory attempted to sort of capture this kind of psychological value. There are problems though even with expected utility theory, that is this kind of normative idea. Um, there are preference reversals. Subjects will rate the value or utility of the same decision differently uh, depending on how um, you frame the discussion. And then we end up with what's called the framing effect. Uh, and so here's a classic uh, framing effect example from uh, the Nobel Prize winning work of Tversky and Kahneman. Imagine the U.S. is preparing for an outbreak of an unusual disease which is expected to kill 600 people. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume that the exact scientific estimate of the consequences of the programs are as follows. If program A is adopted, 200 people will be saved. If program B is adopted, there is a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds probability that no people will be saved. Which program do you prefer? So just make a decision and think about it, A or B. Now our second decision is, if program C is adopted, 400 people will die. If program D is adopted, there is a one-third probability that nobody will die and a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. Which program do you prefer? Now in my in-person classes, I do uh, this exact demonstration and uh, without fail, we get this pattern, which is the same pattern that Tversky and Kahneman found. People prefer program A and program D. Now not overwhelmingly, oh, well not uh, generally overwhelmingly, but not, not everyone. Um, obviously program A and program C are the same. 200 people will be saved, that means 400 people will die. Um, if pro there's one third probability that 600 people will be saved, that's a one-third probability that nobody will die, and a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. So what's happening here is when we frame in terms of gain, we are risk-averse. When we frame in terms of loss, we are risk-seeking. And in fact, that's the reason why so many decisions are framed in terms of loss. Um, in 2003, when we went into Iraq, uh, into the Iraq War, uh, it was framed as what we had to lose if we didn't go in. It was n wars never fought in terms of gain. It's always in terms of what we have to lose if we don't go to war. So in 2004, um, gay marriage was a big issue in the um, elections. This is when all the um, gay marriage amendments were on state uh, ballots. Uh, there's a long history behind that, uh, but that's where this uh, really started was in 2004. Obviously, uh, this has been um, fixed by the Supreme Court, but what's really interesting about this is the National Annenberg Election Survey um, conducted a couple of polls uh, to see what the electorate thought. And the Annenberg Election Survey is nonpartisan. They simply want to know what is the mood of the country in regards to amendment, constitutional amendments regarding gay marriage. And again, this is in 2004. So in the first survey, they're asked, would you favor or oppose an amendment to the US Constitution saying that no state can allow two men to marry each other or two women to marry each other? 49% opposed, 42% favored. Uh, a few days earlier, they asked, would you favor or oppose an amendment to the US Constitution that would allow marriage only between a man and a woman? With that wording, 59% were in favor, and 33% were opposed. So what's the difference? It's how the question is framed. 
One is framed in terms of taking something away, no state can allow. And the other is framed in terms of allowing only. So there, while it's theoretically the same question, that wording completely changes the way in which people respond. And that's really important because what it tells us is that people are very emotional in terms of how we make decisions and our emotions are a big part of our decisions. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about heuristic approaches in the next lecture.